great. It's Michelle Barker here. Let me just share my screen and I'll just take us through a very brief intro. Uh, as people have said, there's a link to the notes and the slides, which we'll keep putting into the chat if you haven't already got it, so that you can follow along. Uh, firstly, just to, to talk about how we got to being here today and running this event. Uh, it's because I think we're all aware that community engagement is getting increasingly recognised as important in our sector. And of course, community engagement has been going on for a long time, but as, as a community, as we undertake research more and more in teams and in fact in communities and involving citizen science, and the communities become equally important in, in research support areas such as uh, recognition uh, and career development, uh, that uh, we're seeing more and more people with the title community manager, but we're also seeing a lot of people who have a little bit of that responsibility, uh, but may not necessarily get any recognition for it or, or, or support on the kinds of skills that, uh, that are needed. And certainly the three of us that organised this event, uh, Daniel, Jeremy and I, felt that we we're all involved in running communities, but there was a lot that we didn't know and uh, we were looking for ways to help everyone learn. So there's some great exemplars in the community of organisations who've been running communities very well for a long time. We have some of them speaking today. And there's also fantastic organisations uh, who can, <clears throat> excuse me, provide a lot of support and training and networking uh, uh, that are also speaking today on, on how to increase community development. So the agenda today is in the collaborative notes, uh, if you'd like to refer to it. Uh, what we aim to do is have some conversations that enable you to, to realise that many people have the same kind of problems that, or challenges that you do. So there's some lightning talks uh, where some established communities will talk about the challenges uh, and some of their solutions. We're having a, fee, a small group feedback session to start developing some uh, networks between all of you because it's another, it's really important to us as another aim for this event uh, that you develop some contact with other people that could support you. Uh, then we were very fortunate after the break uh, to have Lou Woodley from the CSE, CCE leading session on fundamentals on community engagement uh, and then we'll wrap up for today. Note that we have another session tomorrow, which is not a repeat of today. It's actually a continuation. Uh, the workshop is two two-hour sessions. Though, of course, you can just come to one of them if you wish. Tomorrow we'll build on some of what we've done today. Uh, so we'll be talking, uh, we'll have Lou again talking about community champions as a next step of evolution. And then after the break, uh, we'll have Toby Hodges and Sarah Rona from the Carpentries uh, talking about community sustainability and how to deal with that fantastic problem that your community is growing well, uh, but you'd really like to, to make it manageable and uh, to succeed. Sorry. Uh, just to briefly explain why my organisations involved, the research software organisation, like many of you, has a mission, as a vision uh, that research software be more widely recognised. And so we work by bringing research software communities together. So the communities that I work with are of other organisations and uh, my, my co-hosts today also all work in communities. So we'll be looking at lots of different examples of different types of communities as we go through today. Um, lastly, just briefly, we'll be coming back to this point um, over and over again the next two days that there are lots of ways you can continue this discussion, get professional training and support, uh, join networks such as the CSCCE panels and the Society of RSE panels. And perhaps all of you can contribute uh, other ideas there as well. So without any further ado, we're now going to get into the five minute lightning talks. So I'll hand the floor over to Daniel now uh, to talk about the RSE German experience. Thank you, Michelle. And hi, everybody from my side. So um, my lightning talk, running a first local chapter meeting. Um, so this is really a very quick report on my personal experience of trying to start a community. Um, and that actually was in uh, Münster in uh, Germany, where I work at the University of Münster. So uh, what was our first meeting like? Uh, we had a first meeting at a, at a pub 
with uh, a little over 20 participants. So that was really great. I just sent around emails and uh, asked people personally. And uh, it was a really fun meeting. Uh, it was an, a great experience getting to know each other. Um, all participants had set some close relation to university. And uh, we quickly realized that we shared the same set of challenges. Um, that is, for example, what, what most RZs um, um, experience. Uh, the recognition for software wasn't big. Um, people were not happy with the roles they were giving or were worried about career opportunities, etc. So I felt like there really was a good, um, good spirit and a good, good potential uh, to have a local, a local group that, that actually meets regularly. So then we had a second meeting, which uh, didn't go as well. So we met in a seminar room. We only had six participants and we still had a very great focused exchange on a couple of topics. Um, and uh, so one was uh, as, as um, weird or fun as you can imagine. Somebody was uh, talking about um, uh, text, his favorite text editor, and giving an introduction to that. And another um, topic we talked about was actually uh, preparing a course together for RC topics at, at Münster University. Uh, so they went all right, but then the next meeting didn't happen yet. Uh, first of all, I think uh, we were struggling a bit with finding topics. And uh, but then also quickly, I realized that there is uh, really some online fatigue due to the pandemic last year. And uh, whenever I send out a poll for scheduling to, I think by now a mailing list of, of um, close to 40 people, I just got a handful of replies. And uh, that really uh, wasn't, wasn't sort of uh, pushing things along as I would have hoped. And then I personally moved to another city and couldn't on the ground get to, or, or get people to participate. Um, on top of the pandemic, where, where in-person meetings were really, really rare uh, last year. Uh, and that really is sort of the, where I would, what I would call the failure of starting this community, uh, that uh, I didn't manage to move uh, participants into co-organizer roles and uh, to get people from being passive in meetings and, and just joining and coming along and becoming active in shaping uh, what the community looks like. So as relates to that, I'm involved in the German RC community and uh, I am also there in the, in the board, a member of the board. And uh, I then partly due to my personal experiences, uh, started a website and started an initiative to help uh, people uh, start new chapters in Germany. So that's the website with uh, a little bit of information how we can start a chapter, what that means. Um, the requirements are really low. We just want there to be a contact person. And I've put up some material that I've um, found and a few other people uh, found useful or uh, could be helpful for other people to start uh, new groups. Um, so I'm not going to run. To, so the, the website is in German actually. So this is uh, uh, an English version of uh, some of the core points. I'm not going to run through all of them, but uh, they might be interesting for others to uh, take a look at afterwards um, on top of the great advice that uh, we'll hear about um, in the workshop today and tomorrow. So this is my hard earned um, individual experience. And I personally look really forward to um, learn what the experts have to say uh, during the next few hours. Um, so highlight here from my lessons learned, I think is try to piggyback on existing open initiatives or existing institutional mailing lists and user groups to get people to the table because uh, whenever you run a new RSE group meeting, um, there will be a lot of people who have never heard the term RSE, but after some thinking um, will say, yes, actually I am an RSE. And I hope we have uh, many more of uh, those experiences. Thank you for your attention. And I hand over back to Michelle and the next speaker. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I think that it's great that you've shared some of those challenges, which are common to, to many of us and uh, also useful to see some of that advice. I'm sure we'll all be getting lots of 
great ideas from things that each other ha has done as we progress through the next four hours over these two days. Now we have a talk uh, from Nordic RSC. I'd like to welcome Anne and uh, you can share your screen now, Anne, and uh, go ahead. I hope you can see the slides. Yeah, perfect. So I will talk about the Nordic RIC and uh, why uh, we are developing the international RIC community, which seems to be a bit ambitious, but in fact, you will see this is the other way around. Um, so why a Nordic RIC network makes sense for us? Um, because we are very close from each other. So we are five Nordic countries plus three Baltic countries here. Um, we are very few people, in fact, and uh, we have less uh, than 30 million inhabitants in total for all the countries, but we are geographically quite close. So, for instance, I'm in Oslo. I'm closer from people working in Sweden here or here than people working in Norway in uh, Tromsø in the north. Uh, and for this reason, we have also uh, many existing partnerships, and this is uh, uh, what, how it started. We have close connection for teaching for research, we have close cultural connection, good transportation between the different countries. And more importantly, we had the opportunity to get joint funding through the Nordic infrastructure collaboration. And this is probably the key and why we started with this international network. Um, but it comes with some challenges uh, because everything is nice at the beginning, but when it comes to um, sharing the cost or the responsibilities, it is uh, becoming a bit more challenging. So for instance, when you want to register the association, you need to choose one country, which one. Uh, you need to have a board member from other countries, then you have additional costs. Who is paying for this? You need to choose one language for the paperwork, which one? Uh, so for now we are discussing, maybe Swedish, we are not sure yet. And usually you need to support to have some support initially at the national level. And it's getting more difficult to get funding at the national level because uh, you need to justify why you want to do it with other uh, people in other countries. So for community, community building, the difficulty uh, is also, if you don't have representative from all the countries from the day one, it's getting very difficult to engage with new uh, members if you don't have any local network for onboarding the new members. And this is also where we have some difficulties in some countries, uh, for instance. Um, and here this is uh, the history, and I want to put the history of the Nordic RSC in perspectives with community building. Everything started with face-to-face -face meeting. So we started very quickly in January 2018. We had split blogging session, we were all together, and it was a group of small people. Then we started the website and everything was quite fast. We wrote a blog post, so it's uh, very quick here. Um, but then already to organize a, a real conference, it took more time. I mean, it's for some logistics, some funding. We had a first meetup meet up at the night conference in Copenhagen in May 2019. And then um, now we have the pandemic, uh, it's getting more and more difficult. We had to move everything to virtual. We are still hoping to register the association by the end of this year, mostly because we have funding for this. So we need to use this funding, but uh, we see this is getting quite difficult when everything is moved virtual. You need from time to time to be able to meet uh, locally. Uh, so here, this is some way to connect with the Nordic RSC. Our main channel is a Zulit chat uh, from Code Refinery because we are all virtual. So for us, virtual meeting is, uh, is a norm. We are meeting every week on, thurs on Thursday at 9 CT. Uh, we have virtual coffee break, and this is really to engage with local um, RSC, so real, real RSC, doing real RSC work. Well, this bi-weekly uh, Nordic RSC virtual meeting, this is more to discuss about the association in itself. And we have it every uh, when, uh, odd week on uh, Wednesday at 4 CET. And here we see we are getting somewhere, um, but for the RSC virtual meeting, sometimes there is nobody. Um, so and people are very busy with this uh, pandemic. So this is hard to, to really meet uh, virtually. We have a, a membership form available. We don't see many new members coming since the pandemic, and this is probably one of the biggest challenge. And uh, that's it. So you see, there are some advantages and disadvantages of uh, going uh, international. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, that's fantastic. 
Uh, really good to see how it's evolved and the different steps that you've gone through there. For our third lightning talk, uh, we're going to move away from the world of research software engineering uh, because the roles of people involved in community in in engagement and the kinds of challenges that they face and the solutions to them are, of course, uh, universal, uh, not simply uh, limited uh, to uh, the research software engineering community. So I'd now like to invite Anya to talk about PRISMS, uh, the Professional Whoa. Research Investment and Strategy Managers. Over to you, Anya. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, yeah, so um, thanks firstly to Jeremy for inviting me to, to present this. Um, I'd like to do yeah, there we go. Um, just to give you an outline because it is a different community to the RSEs. Um, what we call professional research investment and strategy managers, it's actually quite a new term which, um, which I kind of created last year around this time of the year. So it was pretty much um, on the day mid-March when the idea came about because of um, me struggling to find um, to find like some sort of home or identification of my role within the uh, university I was working in. So um, professional research investment strategy managers are basically um, managers who, met, um, who work on externally funded grants. So large strategic investments, multi-partner, uh, multidisciplinary often. Um, so the people who sit at the core of these grants to keep all the working streams together and, and tie it all together to like a cohesive, um, sensible um, research team environment um, to deliver on the objectives of the grant. Now, um, what started with me being not quite sure where I fit and where my career pathway is within a higher education institution, um, I reached out to a few colleagues um, in, in, in March, April, um, at different universities where I know, knew they do similar roles because I didn't even know within my own institution who is doing a similar job to what I did. Um, so there was no local network whatsoever. It is to date not possible to identify other people who are externally funded within the institution and do similar roles um, in, in an easy manner anyway. Um, but I knew through conferences of a couple of people in other institutions, I reached out to them to say, look, you know, this is what I think our role is. Um, this is what I perceive as the challenges in terms of career development, um, 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 job security, because we all or most of us are funded um, externally. Um, and in terms of recognition of these roles by the institution, by the funders, um, which then impacts on, you know, the lack of um, job security and um, progression and development pathways and where we are homed within the institutions. Um, so my colleagues and the other um, university said, yeah, that resonates very strongly with us. So we started drawing up a document that then um, was disseminated through word of mouth again to other people they knew and um, a very small bunch of people working remotely because we were in, in the start of the pandemic. So there was no way of meeting um, in the real world um, uh, kicked off what is now a network of over 170 members across almost 40 higher education institutions in the UK. Um, most of them, or half of them, have a PhD, usually in a STEM subject. Um, some come from the Hass side, and 90% um, of these people are actually women. Um, so, in terms of EDI, it became quite apparent that we have highly qualified, highly experienced people spread all across the universities in the UK who experience similar challenges in terms of lack of recognition, lack of opportunities, lack of development, and lack of job security. Um, now, in terms of building this community, I didn't know at the time when I started this whole thing, whether it is a thing or not, whether it's just me being a bit weird in my institution, but clearly there is a need because so quickly within a year's time, we grow so much and that's just through word of mouth and um, using the RSE um, channel and um, the UK Association for Research Managers um, and Administrators to spread the word of this new network of people who currently fall between the cracks. Um, and my key challenges with building this community and, and, and engaging and managing it is time commitment, um, finding the people, managing expectations and engaging the people. So these are the four items I think are for me the most challenging. So, and just to draw on that a little bit, time commitment, it's my actual day job 
where's the prison pet project right so i am um the co-director for operations and relations of a research center for material science in exeter in the southwest of england we have um a, a big doctoral training program with like 55 or so phd students on it that needs managing so on the whole the the, the center is already 100 people strong with academics postdocs phd students plus the external partners and we were just awarded um, a grant to build a UK metamaterials network in that science area, which part of my role is now going to be allocated to. Um, so it's going to be fun, but also it's quite full on. I already have so much other things to do. Um, and the prison project for me is like a hard pet project, um, but I don't have actually enough time to fully, you know, deal with this. Um, 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 and that's the same for other people in this in, in this position who are interested in the prison project, but actually have a full time job already. So finding the people is uh, the second challenge. Um, I did say, you know, they are managers of large externally funded investments, but they have a range of job titles. They they are spread out across the institution. So often there is no local network, as I mentioned. So really, just identifying them is quite challenging. But I'm quite happy that word of mouth and and some of the existing slack and and um um uh, what's it called uh, newsletter channels but used by other organizations that are kind of connected to to that um in, environment um helped to raise awareness and drive this um community growth but it is very much word of mouth communication at the moment still and no way of meeting people in real life, not even locally within the institutions when we found them. So the next challenge was engaging the people. I find coffee chats don't work. Like we started off with weekly coffee chats as an offer for people to get together, but everyone is so overworked. If there's no clear target, they don't prioritize this because it's not their day job. So we moved to more like monthly, six weekly targeted topic discussions. So for example, on fixed term contracts, you know, what are our issues around this? Can we, do we have models in other institutions where there is already an underwritten team that can be used as a role model and spread the word or industry engagement, you know, just um, experience exchange on certain targeted topics that seems to work better. Um, so rather than having like zero or four people who always come and moan about the same stuff, we actually have constructive discussions with like 25 or so people in the room um, in these workshops. Um, I find that just getting getting used to the fact there's a silent majority in the background who won't engage but who are willing to assign something is actually really useful and I shouldn't need to get frustrated about that because we're like oh no why don't phone people engage and it's like because they are busy and as long as they kind of sign their name under an important document that's fine um um then embracing different views and experiences, I think, is also very important because it's such a diverse group of people with still very diverse roles, depending on this research team they're um, embedded in. So making sure that we all keep an open mind and take these different views on board and not be too narrow in our approach is quite, quite important in engaging them so they don't feel excluded. And communications as well. Again, there's a time commitment there. So whenever a new member joins through the network website, I try to send an email, like a personalized email, just to welcome them and um, um, and, and ask them why they joined, what their motivations are, um, and then have like frequent newsletters with latest updates and stuff when something happened, um, but not making it too often for not to spam inboxes. So um, yeah, so that's the engaging bit. And then managing expectations. Um, in particular, because the network is so young and the roles are so broad, I find it very difficult to actually um, say, um, well, I think some people are, can get quite quickly upset if they feel like they're part of it, but not really. Um, so what I find is really important is to have clear objectives of what are we trying to achieve so people can align to those. And the other one is clear target membership. So being very defined on who, who you're approaching, you know, um, so, it, takes time to refine and um, yeah, I, I do struggle with upsetting people, but at the same time, you need to be focused on what you want to do because I feel like otherwise I just can't do it. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anya. And I really like your comments on, on how you need to manage your own time. In the collaborative notes, there's an attendance list where people can add details. And one of the questions we've asked is, what percentage of your time is spent on community management. 
Our last talk is Simon Hetrick uh, from the Society of ROC. So Simon, if you'd like to now take the floor. Great, okay. So uh, I'm not from the Society of ROC anymore. I stepped down in September. Uh, that was my uh, that was my last thing. I, the society was set up and it's kind of stable, and and then I could step down. So um, I've been asked today to to do a bit of a history of um, of RSE, which is a talk I've done a number of times, but um, I've been asked this time to do it and to sort of phrase it as uh, problems we faced and the solutions and the way that we overcame it came them. I've got five minutes, so I better get started. Um, okay, so when we first started. Um, looking at this problem, the, you know, research software engineers have been around in, in research for as long as there has been computers in research as well. So we're looking at what, 40, 50 years. Um, and people have known for a long time that there was this group that was spending their time writing software and not being recognized for that work, even though the software was becoming more and more important. Um, and one of the big reasons why well, we managed to like start to overcome the problem and and the others hadn't is that we we gave the the name the role a name and that was back in the collaborations workshop in 2012 um and like what's in a name well it's not just it makes it easy to refer to yourself and to your group it also gives you that start that um you can start to build a community around if you don't know what you're called you can't build a community so that's the first major change that we made um and then You've got yourself a name, so the next thing is building the community. And you know, we we were completely new at this, so we started writing um, uh, you know, articles for, for for newsletters and for for you know, like Times Higher and, and things like that. Um, we started blogging about it. I would I would shoehorn something about research software engineers into every single presentation I did, where regardless of whether it was appropriate or not. Uh, and so would a number of the other people who who were there at the start. Um, and you're constantly waiting. And I think this is what like Daniel was talking about earlier on. You know, the first meeting was there was there was a good chunk of people, and the second meeting there weren't as many people. And you're constantly worried that you've you've already had your sort of bright time and the biggest you could be, and and it's going to be a, a slow degradation from that point onwards. But but when I first felt that actually, you know, we've built something here, the, and this is going to keep itself going. There's enough momentum. We've, made, you know, we've reached that critical mass. That would be at the RC conference in 2016. So I stood up and gave a presentation in front of 230 people who are now calling themselves research software engineers. They'd come from 16 different countries. And that was the moment at which I thought that RSE is going to be a thing. Um, so it's a thing and as a community, um, um, but, but it still had to be embedded back into conventional research. It was easy still at that stage, I think, to say that research software engineering was this thing that, you know, a number of, number of people in academia had got upset about not being recognized and they've built themselves a community, but it wasn't recognized by conventional academia. And, the, and I think the thing that really changed there was the support we got from EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, um, when they put together the RSC Fellowship, because this was the first time where we were starting to see that universities and people, senior management in universities began to understand what an RSE was. Um, and again, I think it was Daniel that was saying about, you know, um, you, you have to, you go to these meetings and you define what a research software engineer is and people come in um, thinking they're something else and they leave um, finally having found their tribe and knowing themselves as research software engineers. Um, doing that for the research software engineers themselves is important, but getting the senior management and universities to understand that it was important takes something quite big. And it took for us the RSE fellowship that was put together by the EPSRC. Um, and then, then growth has been pretty fast ever since that time. Um, we in the UK RSE Association was the informal um, organization we put together. So there was literally just a group of people said they would run it and they put their time towards it. Uh, and we got up to one and a half thousand members. Um, at this stage, we were making money out of the RSE conference that we were using to run the next conference and to run other RSE event events. But it was all sitting in a bank account uh, in the, at the University of Southampton with my name on it. And I really did not feel that, that was a, the right way for holding the funds for the community. And it was obvious that we were gonna need something bigger and better. Um, and that came around in 2019 with the setting up of the Society of Research Software Engineering. Um, and for the first time, we had a new learned society somewhere that you know, had the prestige and the, um, the ability to sort of lobby and advocate for the community that wasn't tied to any single person. 
And it also had, because it's a charity, it could hold its own funds, which means that we can now employ people. It means that, you know, we can do all of the accounting and everything and all the, the open book stuff that we want to do that, you know, she was the company that I'm not going to disappear off with the funds and go and live in Acapulco or something. Like, so it was a really important time uh, to, um, for the community, I think, when we first had this, the society set up, because it was the, the first learn, new learned society that's been set up in a long time. I hope that it'll be around for hundreds of years to come. And with that, we're up to date on my history of RSE in five minutes, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. It's fantastic to have a success story. I think we all aim to get to that point where we know it's going to survive. Uh, it's good to hear that there's still challenges that come after that. Uh, so I hope those four talks have uh, shown you some of the breadth of, of uh, challenges that can be faced and uh, across a range of maturity of communities. And uh, I'm sure you've identified uh, with some of those challenges and uh, we'll spend more time over the next uh, couple of days thinking about how to address them.